I noticed you put your glasses on for the first time ever. <laughs> I thought, look here, we are going to hear the words today. Oh, what amazing. And I want to thank all the parents that bring these kids to church. I mean, my goodness, if more, fo if more folks would be like that, bring these kids to church, they'd have a, boy, they'd have a head start on the world, wouldn't they? Amen. Amen. And I don't know, I'm going to have to get that out of my mind. She's going to have me laughing all day. How <laughs> rude. Oh, mercy. Yeah, I'll tell somebody's mama whose kid that was, but I won't embarrass it now. That was my biggest fear when Colt was little. He'd go to the front front of that pastor and I'd be like, oh, Lord, I hope he does not repeat anything Melanie said. <laughs> oh, yeah. Whew. Well, I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, what I was sharing with the kids today. And you know, when I, when I was up reflecting about this, and, you know, I apologize because a lot of times the scripture text doesn't get put in the uh, bulletin. It's all Melissa's fault. No, it's actually my it's actually my fault. Like yesterday morning, I was halfway through a sermon. And I said, no, that's not what I want to do. Click, delete, and start it all over. So that was yesterday. But you know, one thing I've said before, you know, in our Christian walk, in our Christian faith, we accept the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. We're baptized. We have salvation. It tells us in Romans we're justified in the eyes of the Lord. That means we're innocent. We got the clean slate. We're sanctified, which means we're set apart as something holy and special. I've, I've preached about that. But that's where the work starts, y'all. I mean, it's tough, isn't it? I mean, we live in a world where, where society wants to tell us how to live, how to act, what's acceptable, what's the norm, what we should be doing. And so that gets confusing because we live in the world all the time. But we're supposed to be living in the Word. Because that is where we begin to learn how to... Good morning, Eden. It's good to see you here this morning. Uh... That's where we begin to learn how to act, how to be a Christian. And that's tough, isn't it, amen? It is tough to figure out how to be a Christian. And that's why a lot of my sermons, if you notice, a lot of it comes out of the New Testament. There'll be some Old Testament scripture. But I think it's important if for a lot of folks, the only opportunity they're getting to hear how to live today is at 10 o'clock this morning, then that's what I focus on. Because we all, I know we all, me included, struggle with how to live in this world in a way that pleases God. And so I think that the story of David is a, is a great example, is a great example for a lot of us. Because if y'all haven't noticed, which I'm sure you have, that in this country, Christians are being told more and more what's acceptable, you know, and what isn't. Uh, what's going to be socially acceptable and what isn't. You know, you can't pray here out loud because you might offend somebody. If you take a kneel here and pray, well, that might offend somebody. And let's face it, when we put Christianity on display, the only one that really gets offended is Satan. You know, some politicians say that we're supposed to be tolerant or change our religious truths, the truths and the beliefs, so they become socially acceptable. And we hear that. But you know, that's nothing new. Because Paul was confronted with that. Paul was confronted with that during the time that he was on his, his uh, missionary journeys. And Paul wrote something just to the opposite to the church in Philippi. Instead, Paul's message was that Christians were to stand strong in one spirit. That Christians were to have a heart for the Lord and to live in a way that would please God. And not be pleasing to man. So basically it means that we cannot let society dictate the truth. But instead, society needs to understand that this, this right here is an unchanging truth. It was no different 2,000 years ago than it is today. This is the truth. This is how we're to act. And I think that's important because God loved us so much that as confusing as He knew life was going to be, he wanted to make sure that we had the truth written down on pages. So that anytime we get into a bind, anytime we don't understand something, we can open this book and its truth never changes. It's always the same. You will never be confronted with anything that isn't in the Bible. He gave us His Word which is unchanging and it's constant. And this truth has the ability to produce something that's amazing. It has the ability to produce godliness. 
The truth has the ability to build a church family that serves as a light in its community. That serves as a church that can put godliness on display. Godliness. Godliness is godlikeness. When you study in the word godlikeness, there's really three aspects to it. There is the ability to think in a godly manner. Because once you have the ability to think in a godly manner, you then have the ability to act in a godly manner. Now, y'all know, y'all have heard me say this over and over, and I will preach it a lot on godliness. We have to, our brains, our renewing of the mind has to be done in a way that we begin to think more godly. Because when we do that, our actions reflect our godly thinking. And when they do that, it gives us the ability to do what God is looking for. To labor with Him. To work with Him. To serve God. Because that, as Christians, is what we're called to do. That is what we're called to be. We are called to be a people after God's own heart. Just like I talked about with David earlier with the kids. See, back in Genesis, I'm going to take us back to Genesis for a minute. When people, when the first people, when Adam and Eve were created, remember that God said that he created them in his own image. God's desire for each one of us is to be in his image. But that's not a physical image. It is a spiritual image. It is the person who we are on the inside. It's the image of a Christian family. It's the image of a single Christian. Thinking like God. Having a heart after God's own heart. It's the image of acting godly. Responding in a godly way. It's the image of laboring with God every day in what God is trying to do. And what is God trying to do? Save folks. Reconcile the world. Bring the world back to Himself through His Son. And throughout the Bible we see that God chose people not because of what they physically had to offer, but what they had to offer spiritually. Where their heart was. Folks that had the desire to be godly. People that would, would allow themselves to be used by God and to follow God's ways, God's words, instead of their own. Folks who would have a heart. Folks that would be compassionate about serving and listening to God. In other words, those folks weren't going to let society tell them how they were going to think and how they were going to act. They were not going to be a people that would be conformed to what the world wanted them to be. God's kind of people let God dictate how they would think. God's kind of people let God dictate how they would act. They would let godliness be seen by others through their life. They would put it out there so others would say, you know what, that's got to be a person of God. That is a light for me to follow. When we look at the Bible, look at the examples of the people that were used by God throughout all time. Look at the people. Look at Moses. Moses is not one that you would have chosen to lead people, much less God's chosen people. He was a stutterer. He wouldn't have been able to communicate real well, but yet God used him, didn't he? He was a man after God's own heart. What about Jacob? Jacob lied. Abraham was old. Like I told the kids, the Bible said that David was a small, ruddy boy. A sheep herder. Stuck out away from everybody just watching some old sheep. And then there's Saul. What about Saul? Greatest persecutor of Christians. But God chose him. What about Peter? Peter denied the Lord Jesus Christ three times. If we knew someone that denied Jesus Christ three times... We wouldn't be maybe, they wouldn't be maybe our first pick as a church leader. But Jesus knew something different. Not the kind of folks that we would chose, but they were the people, and not because God was being rude either. <laughs> not because He was being rude. But because He knew their hearts. He knew their hearts. He knew that they would have, or they did have, a heart after His. He knew 
with His direction that they would show the world godliness. That they would think like, act like, and labor with Him in what He was trying to do. I want to read something. In 1 Corinthians 1, 27-29, it tells us, God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before Him. God purposefully and deliberately has chosen people that the world would overlook. That the world would not say, that's going to be a leader. That's not going to be somebody that makes an impact. Because, but what God sees is something different. He can see into your heart. He knows if you're willing to listen and to follow. Because God wants people who will make a stand for Him and will make a difference in this world. He wants folks that don't bend to society, but kneel for the cross. Back in the Old Testament in 1 Samuel 16, like the story I was telling the kids, God was looking for a replacement. He was looking for a replacement for King Saul. Now, let me say this. In our day and age, King Saul would have probably made a pretty good presidential candidate. He was handsome. He was tall, probably athletic looking. He had some wisdom. He had some humility. And he was very popular. He had all the things people, people would look for in a leader. But here's the thing. God rejected him as his ruler. And God rejected him because when it came to making tough decisions, thinking like God, acting like God, Saul knew what God wanted. But instead, Saul did what Saul wanted to do. This is what the Word says. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's commands. King Saul took the easy way out. King Saul did what was popular. He chose what would make him look good instead of what would glorify God. So, God did what God does. He went looking for somebody who was willing to do what he wanted, what he needed. He went looking for somebody after his own heart. A person, a person that was willing to be led by God. God went and chose David. Hey, David's own father. Think about that. That's what jumped out at me. If you're a parent, you want to choose your own kid, wouldn't you? You think you know your own kids. David, uh, David's own father didn't even think enough of him to bring him in front of the Lord. Have you ever thought about that aspect? His own father did not even think enough about him to bring him in front of the Lord. Goliath sure wasn't scared of him, was he? He hit. So instead, what he did was his own father put his other front sons in front of him. He brought the ones that he thought by his standards, by his worldly standards, would be a king. A prospect for a king. Because in his eyes, David wasn't important. He was a little, what does it say, ruddy? Some, some versions say a little runt. Because he wasn't what the world thought was important. But you see, God sees through. God is able to see through to what is really important. He had a heart after God's own heart. It says here in the scripture, For the Lord seeth not as a man seeth. For a man looketh at the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. You see, David had a heart like God. He was willing to think like God. He was willing to act like God wanted him to act. And he was willing to labor with the Lord in what the Lord wanted him to do. In 2 in Chronicles 16.9 it says this, The eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whom hearts are fully committed to Him. God wants 
folks committed to Him. His purpose, His goals, and His heart. God is looking for people that are committed to His standards that are right here. Now that doesn't mean any of us are perfect. We see that David wasn't perfect. Moses wasn't perfect. Jacob wasn't perfect. Saul wasn't perfect. What it means is we're willing to be changed by God. That we're willing to let God lead us in our lives. And we desire, oh this is a tough one, we desire to be in the presence of the Lord. Desiring to be in the presence of the Lord. This may take me a little bit off track, but have you ever noticed someone that doesn't come to church very often usually doesn't end up serving in the church? And y'all know me, I don't say anything, not my place to judge. I don't serve any, I don't say anything about people that don't come to church. But I thought, if they're truly committed and understand what God's looking for, they're going to want to be in church. They're going to want to grow in faith. They're going to want to be used by God. That's why I feel so blessed in this church. Because we see so many people letting the Lord use them. We want to come together and worship and praise and serve others. Now, maybe I'm being too simple about this in the way I think, but this is, and I've said things like this, but this is the kind of way I look at being used by the Lord. Because, you know, I'm from Louisiana, we've got to think of things real simply up there. <laughs> but, you know, in my life, I love horses. I love training them, riding them, doing all that kind of stuff with them. So, a lot of my lifestyle is centered around those horses, as a lot of people's are that come here. And I think I desire to be around them and do those things, which is probably why I became a, uh, this big reason I became a, a cowboy church pastor instead of a Baptist pastor, because they actually asked me to, to come in. But it was because I liked being immersed in that lifestyle. So when I think about it that way, Shouldn't I even more be desire, desire to be immersed in God's lifestyle? Shouldn't every aspect of what I'm doing in this cowboy way also be immersed in God's lifestyle? Shouldn't I want God to be a part of everything that I'm doing? You see, people who have a heart for God want to be in the presence of God. God's looking for people with a heart after His own heart because they will want to be in the presence of the Lord. And they will want the Lord's presence in everything they're doing. And not only just to be with Him, but to know Him. Because I've always thought about it this way. How can you be godly if you don't know God? I want to read something to you out of Psalm 19, 8-10. It said, David, David wrote this as inspired by the Lord. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. You see... If we act differently than the rest of the world, if we allow the Lord to shape our thinking and our actions, we will show the world godliness. We will show people, we will show others, people after God's own heart. But we have to know what's on his heart to show it to others. David wrote this in Psalm 119, 105, Thy word, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. This is the light unto his path that shows us our direction. Knowing how to respond, knowing how to act, knowing how to think comes from knowing the word, from knowing God. Do you remember back, uh, back when Jesus, you remember when Jesus 
had that expert in the law try to trip him up in a question. It was back in uh, Matthew. Back in Matthew, this expert in the law tries to trip Jesus up. And he says, teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. See, Jesus thought like God. Jesus was able to respond. He was able to think and act like God because he was immersed in God. He was God in the flesh, but he took his direction from God. He allowed God to use him and become a path and a light for others. Jesus was the perfect example of godliness in this world. Jesus never bent to temptation. Jesus didn't do what was politically correct. Jesus didn't do what was socially acceptable. Jesus' actions spoke for who he served because he had a heart after the Lord. You see, godliness is a person that has committed their hearts to God. A person after God's own heart. A person who desires to build their life around God and not just bring them in as something extra. A, per a person committed to the Word of God. A person willing to turn their lives over to God. And I say it this way, and be trained by God. Because the best way somebody from Louisiana like me could figure it out was like this. I always thought of my life like this. That my life was a lot like training a two-year-old colt. It's a lot like training a two-year-old horse was how my life was going to have to be like if I was going to follow the Lord's path. Have you ever rode a two-year-old colt that is just stubborn and ain't going to get along with a pro? I have. We, we call them a colt. I think Saul was a colt, wasn't he? He was bucking the program. Now David, it reminds me of a little black horse I own. If you looked at her, she didn't have any of the physical attributes that we would be looking for. Right, Teddy? She's a little bitty thing like this. Looked like I was riding a dog. But she had more heart and more desire to do her job than any of the others. Kind of reminds me of David, the ruddy little rascal. But see, here's the thing. If that little two-year-old commits to the program, every aspect of what we are doing from that point forward is geared towards an outcome. If that two-year-old buys in the program, and listens and gets trained, gets a new mind about things, has a heart for what it's doing, it's geared in the end to be able to put the sport and its talents on display for everybody else in the arena. Right? You go to the arena, you don't know what's happened over the last two years. But when you see that thing being successful, oh my goodness, that's the best one I've ever seen. It didn't just happen. It took a lot of work. Well, here's the thing. Godliness, to have a heart like the Lord to put God on display, means that you're willing to be changed by God, to be used by God. It's willing to let God train you for the show pen of life. So when people see you out there, they're going to say, wow, they're not looking for the biggest, the best, the youngest, the prettiest. What they're looking for is the performance. They're looking for someone with a heart after the own, with a heart after the Lord. It's all about turning our lives over to God. Like David did, like Moses did, like Jacob did, like Peter did, and being used by the Lord. I've said this before and I think of it like this. Turning your life over to God, it's like signing a contract. But the difference is you're signing a blank contract and you're letting them fill it in as you go. That's godliness. Amen. Amen.